Good morning. Welcome. Are y'all ready to worship the Lord this morning? Go ahead and stand up. Sing with us. in the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lie And if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel low Chain breaker. We've 
Before we get started, I just have something in my heart. Um, Ron McPeak was here. He went home early. He wasn't feeling well. And so I know this does not go according to the order of service, but I really just feel in my heart that we just want to continue to pray for him. If you'll just uh, join me in prayer as we pray for Ron. Um, and, and so let's just go to the Lord. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. And I just we thank you for just uh, your grace and your mercy this morning, Father. And I just lift up Ron to you, Father. Father, I just... Uh, I know his want to be here and his desire to be here, Father. And Father, I just pray that, Father, he's at home. He's at home right now, Father. But I just pray you touch him right now, Father. Just heal him, Father. Just give him comfort knowing that you're in control, Father. Father, I pray that you just give him a peace, Father, that can only come from you, Father. I pray for Cheryl, Father, as she worries, Father. Let her just cast her cares and her worries onto you, Father. Father, just minister to them right now, Father. Father, I pray that they're able to get into the doctor and the doctor, Father, I pray that you just guide them, Father, their hands and their thoughts and their actions, Father. Father, I pray that you give them the wisdom and discernment, Father, and how best to diagnose them and heal them, Father. We're just praying for a miracle, Father. We pray for your will. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for, for allowing me just to lift him up. Uh, it's great, to, again, to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. And, and, and so I don't see any first-time visitors, but that's okay. Let's get it from where we are and greet those that are here. Amen.
have Miss Jane come up. She's going to read today's scripture reading while she's on her way up. Just a quick reminder, guys, if you have not signed up yet for the guys here in, in, the, in, in the sanctuary and those online, if you haven't signed up yet, don't forget our men's conference is this Friday. Our men's conference is this Friday. Please sign up uh, to be in attendance for that as it would be greatly appreciated. God bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 32, verses 1 through 6. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever of heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach you. Let us pray. Dear holy trying God, we humbly come before your presence this morning to worship you and give you praise. Search us, dear Lord, and create in us a pure heart. Enable us to focus on you and you alone, that we may hear your message clearly and cause us to repent of our wicked ways and move us to follow your precepts. Teach us holy reverence, true humility, and grant us the grace to embrace your promises. Bless our our pastor as he delivers your holy word, and let this church be a light of Christ's love in this community and beyond. Please fulfill in us your purposes for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray.
shall soon dissolve like sun, the sun, or bear to shine.
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. That should be the prayer of our heart, especially in these chaotic seasons that we're living in. We just experience the presence of God in fresh, dynamic, real, converting ways. Amen. Where we just see the glory of God come. But that's what we're talking about when we are speaking about this topic of revive and thrive. What we read a while ago from Psalm 32, I hope you're paying attention. If not, I'm going to preach on it just to get a little more clarity, all right? So you can open your Bible there. We'll be making some references to it. You keep your thumb in there or your, your phone open to that, whatever you're using today. As we talk about revive and thrive, where we're seeing God move in such unique and blessed and holy supernatural ways in our midst. Amen? Uh, we talked about revival just as uh, we talked about humility last week. I want to talk about step two in this process. And I believe it really is a process how God brings us to a place to hear and see. But step number two, that once we've humbled ourselves, then there's this, there's this necessity that we learn how to be honest. Honest with ourselves, honest with each other, honest with God. And Psalms 32 is a great passage where David the psalmist just is rehearsing what he did in his time of repentance with the Lord. Um, many of you are familiar with David's sin with Bathsheba and what went on there. And this is kind of flows out of that, you know. Uh, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. That state of blessedness is the state of revival that it's talking, you know, uh, that blessedness is revival that we're talking about. It said, blessed is the man whom the Lord does not imp count or impute his iniquity, you know, for it doesn't count his sins. He said, in, in that man whom spirit, there, there's no guile or there's no deceit. That's revival. Uh, for a simpler definition we talked about, it, revival is that extraordinary movement of the spirit of God in the hearts of God's people, and that produces extraordinary results. Say, so what do you mean? I believe it's extraordinary outside the norm of what we would normally see, this extraordinary acts of repentance. People are just repenting, all right? And they're getting their hearts right with God. Extraordinary love. There, there's new expressions of, of love for God. The extraordinary soul winning, extraordinary worship, extraordinary conversions take place. As you study history, you see there's been these seasons of times uh, in history uh, whether it was the Hebrides Island revivals or the First Great Awakening in the 1700s or the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s, uh, there's been these seasons and times where God has uniquely moved in the hearts of people and resulted in, in these things of just a new attitude of worship uh, and a new attitude of people towards God and towards church and towards each other and even towards the lost. It, so the best way that we describe these seasons of supernatural, extraordinary moves of God is just revival. Let me give you a simple illustration. The first great awakening was in the 1700s in, in the American colonies prior to the, the revolution. And God just came across the continent, the, the, the colonies, and there was just this fire of revival that spread. They said the Methodist church increased their attendance and their membership in that church during this season of revival by 1,400%. Can you imagine that? Now, you say, well, the colonies were growing. Obviously, I'm a little bit of a history buff. And so, you know, the American colonies were growing at about an average of 200% at this season of time. But we're talking about people coming to God and getting right with God and getting in fellowship with other saints. 1,400%. The Baptists in Virginia at this time, they said every church, they reported, was having meetings that lasted five to six hours. And many times, these meetings would often go all night long. They said in three summer months, in three different counties in Virginia, in 1770, it says in that three-month period, the recorded conversions were this. The first month, 1,600. The second month, 1,800. The third month, 800. All these people are getting saved. It's a total of 3,200 people recorded. We don't know how many were not recorded, but that they kept records of that came in a three small county area within Virginia. That is just a supernatural move of God. There's no way to explain that many people coming to Christ. During the prayer revivals of 1858, it was about a two-year period that went to 1858, 59. In those two years, there was this move of God that took place again. The population of the United States at that time was about 30 million people, all right? They said during this two-year revival, they, they recorded over 1 million people that came to Christ during that two-year period. 1 million people. Now, if you were to translate to that to today's numbers and the percentages, it would mean we're not at 30 million anymore. We're about 330 million. But that would mean that over a two-year period, that in the United States, if we saw another move like that happen again, that we would see over 10 million people converted in a two-year period. That's revival. That's when God moves. 
Some of you have been in scenarios and situations like that, whether it was for a season, a week, when you had God really move in your church. Uh, and I'm not talking about just personal, because I think we all see personal revival at different times. But I'm talking about a corporate move of God, where God just does those supernatural, unexplainable, super ordinary things, and he just moves in incredible ways. Last week, we said the first step in all those was always humility, where people come to a place of, back to a place of God dependency. I just need the Lord. And sometimes, you know, it takes a, a lot for people to ever get to that place. And it's, it's interesting that once we come to that place and we give our hearts to Christ because we realize our desperate need for salvation, how easy it is to begin to drift back to, you know, just the, the normal, all right, instead of, being, instead of really being on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of really trusting the Lord. But when God starts moving in these kind of ways, it's, it's a different kind of thing. So humility comes first. But after humility, we have to come to this place where, where there's honesty, you know, that we just get open before the Lord. And, and I think that's the first and the greatest step to really seeing God do something in our life. If we could just be honest with ourselves, if we could just be honest with God, then things would change. But we're living in a culture where people really don't comprehend that word anymore, any more than they did humility, obviously, all right? But to be honest about ourselves, about our situation, we're living in a culture of liars. And we like, we like to talk about politicians. You know how you know when a politician is lying, his lips are moving, right? <laughs> but I'm talking about the average American person. And, and, and people readily say, oh, yeah, but hey, yeah, Pastor, I know everybody lies, you know. And sometimes it's those big, fabricated, carefully, delicately worked out lies, right? And sometimes it's those little, what we call white lies. All right, but there is no such thing as a white lie, black lie, green lie, blue lie. They're all lies, and a lie is a lie. Sometimes a lie is not so much with our words that we're saying, but it's by our silence. We just hide the truth and don't speak it, all right? But we're still living a lie, says in 1 John. Sometimes it's by our actions. Sometimes we just try to give a better impression of ourselves than what really is true. I think the greatest way that a lot of Christians have lying is just through exaggerations. And it's usually about their own efforts or their own task or their own abilities or whatever it might be. But it's still a lie. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's the fact is, if we tell lies, that makes us a liar. But we got to this attitude about lying anymore that, well, it's no big deal. Everybody's lying. Now, and, and by the way, there's all types of venues for lying. <laughs> you can lie at work. And sometimes you lie at work. Maybe it's on your Sprint's account. Or maybe it's just to give a better impression of yourself to your supervisors or those co-workers of yours. People lie at home. They lie to their spouse. They lie to their parents. They won't be honest with each other. Children lie to their parents. Parents lie to their children. Not just at work, at home, even at recreation. Lying about your abilities or your lack thereof or your education. Lie to teachers, lie to classmates, lie to friends. You know, and it just continues to go. So I truly believe that the, what really must happen, if we're truly honest, if we're being humble, if we truly get humble, then we're truly being honest. But if we seek to cover our sins, or even worse, to justify them, you know, say, well, it's all right because, then we're just simply deceiving ourselves. And the Bible says that the truth is not in it. I, I read a list of, uh, somebody put out one time, said, if, we're, if we were entirely honest every time we sang uh, old hymns or gospel songs, Here's how some of our favorites might come out. I figure you, as I read this, you'll figure out the originals for some of you that were in hymn season, all right? So, where he leads, I'll consider following. Oh, how I like Jesus. Another is, instead of fill my cup, it's fill my spoon, Lord. And the song says, it's no secret. Well, it is my secret what God can do. Or what, a, what an acquaintance we have in Jesus. Or blessed be the tie that doesn't cramp my style. Another was, uh, I surrender some. <laughs> or I'm fairly certain that my Redeemer lives. This was a classic. Sit up, sit up for Jesus. <laughs> or take my life and let me be. And then I love to talk about telling the story. <laughs> so I love to tell the story. That would pretty much lay out the, the bare honest truth. But the Bible gives us a very clear picture that if there's a wellspring of honesty that's really flowing out of our heart, then there's going to be a wellspring of redemptive results. We're going to see God do something in our lives when we truly get honest. 
David is a picture of a guy who walked and lived in deception. We don't know how long this deception lasts, but we do know that he finally comes clean in Psalms 51. And let's just pair it Psalms 51 with Psalms 36. We see a man who's finally getting honest with God. He's getting honest with everyone else. He's getting honest with the Lord. It's amazing. Let me just, let me just read it again. It's only six verses, Psalm 32. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away, my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah means think about that. <laughs> Think about just drying and wasting away. It's just through the drought of the summer. But he said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I didn't, hi I, I didn't hide. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. <laughs> Think about that. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. In other words, there is a season, a time to come when God's convicting us. Surely in a flood of great waters, you will not reach him. This is a heart of a man who's just laid himself bare before everybody, no matter what anybody says or thinks he does. He's confessing his sin, and he's making no cover-up, and he's really digging into it where he uses multiple terms for this word of sins and transgressions and iniquities and faults and failures are just all laid bare here. Let me give you a few points I think will help us as we think about honesty this morning and what it really truly means to be honest before the Lord. See if it comes up. Honesty brings about the blessing of full forgiveness verses one and two he talks about how my sins my sins are forgiven that alone is worth shouting stopping out and have a praise party over because when you really realize the ugliness of your sin and you realize the 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 fault and the the fruit of your sin in your life and where it's led to and what's brought about all the destruction we really look at sin as sin and when we stop and say but my sins are forgiven that 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 begins to just explode with revival Literally, my sins have been dealt with by God. My sins have been taken away. They're as far as the east is from the west, they shall never be remembered. Your sins will never be brought up before God. They'll never be reminded back to you even. God says, I've washed them as far as the east is from the west. But not only forgiven, he says my sins are covered in this. And, and the idea is it has to do with completely eradicated, concealed, done away with. All you see now is the redemptive grace. All you see now is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That the word that the word that he talks about here is a word which means that God has fully and completely taken care of your sin. Just as the children of Israel had the blood sprinkled on the, the lintel and the doorpost of their home so that the death angel would pass over, God has passed over. The blood is all that is seen in your situation. The mercy, the righteousness, the grace of God. He says, my sins have been forgiven. My sins have been for, for covered and they are not imputed unto me. They're not held on my account. By that way, the word imputed is a word which has to do with accounting. And if you know a little bit of accounting, hopefully you should. You know, you should be keeping credit, uh, score of your, of your money and your bills and stuff. You know that there's no outstanding bills, all right? That everything has been taken care of. That fully everything that you owed in regard to your failure, in regard to your sin, in regard to my disobedience, all of that has been taken care of by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we could just come back to that place to see the glory of that and the beauty of that and the incredible power of that, it would literally bring us back to a place to blow our minds. All right? There's nothing. Maybe we just need to be reminded. There's nothing that you or I can do to, to, to forgive, to cover, or to impute our own sins. Nothing. Nothing. You can make amends, you can make restitution, but still the sin factor is a mark in your life, it's a mark on your account, and only the blood of Jesus can resolve that issue and take care of that account. And David is just, he's just bathing in this in this passage. He's just saying, thank God, I've forgiven, I'm, I, 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 I have been covered, and I, nothing's on my account anymore that I've been washed by the, by the blood of the Lamb. Why? I'm honest. But take an account here, folks, if I am not honest, this blessing of forgiveness that he's talking about, when we use these two words, how blessed, how blessed, those first two verses there, we're not going to experience it. We're not going to experience it in our walk. We're not going to experience it in our life. 
if we're not fully, completely honest about our relationship, where we are with God, don't think that God's just going to just overlook those things and say, oh, it's all cool. We're just going to be under this burden because he's going to talk about that as we get in this passage, or, or we're going to walk under this freedom. He, he says here, first of all, that, that, that this grace of God for forgiveness, but he said honesty brings about the blessing of decreased deceit. Let me read this from Spurgeon who made this, this, this statement. Spurgeon said, listen, a liar is not a forgiven soul. There can be no blessedness to tricksters with their plans and their pretending. They are too much afraid of discovery to be at ease. Their house is built on the volcano's brink. Well, that's a powerful statement, is it not? We're pretending. We've whitewashed, so to say. We've covered up our failures, our, our, our deeds, as David was trying to do. But when we come to God, we, we choose to be honest. We step away from the deceit that we've been living in. I think it's real clear if you take any time to study the scriptures, one of the first fruits of all sin in our life is deception. Sin, just disobedience to God just breeds deception. And I, I'll state it again. I've said it a thousand times, and I, I'll say it a thousand more. The tragedy with being deceived is you just don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. And we begin this, this process of and when we would disobey God, that little it just opens the door for a little bit of that deception to come in. And then the more we choose to be dishonest with God and not deal with that deception, then that deception begins to increase in our life. David just saying here, the, the blessing of a man being in, in, in the right relationship with God, he said, in whom is that man's spirit, there's no deceit. There's no more guile left. There's more, no more deceit left. Because when you come to God with honesty, he washes that. But look at David. That's not his story. He deceives himself in his sin, you know. This is, we're talking about the with sin that was Bathsheba, obviously. But first of all, he, <coughs> he just deceives himself. He thinks he can get away with it. He thinks he can just cover it up. He's the king. Who's going to know? Nobody's going to know. Uh-oh, somebody's pregnant. Well, maybe somebody's going to find out. So I gotta, I, he's, got, he's living in such deception. I've got a plan around this. You rise out in the battle. I'm going to bring you right back. Y'all familiar with the story, right? And I'm going to send him into his wife because I just know he wants to be with his wife. And, he'll, you know, he'll lay with her. And obviously, you know, he's been out all battle. He's going to come back home. They're going to take care of marital business. And that will explain the kid. So he deceives himself. And then he brings in Uriah and he deceives him. Ultimately, that doesn't work out because Uriah is such a devoted, loyal soldier. He says, I can't go spend the night with my wife while everybody else is fighting on the front lines, you know. And he doesn't go out, he doesn't go in the night with her. He sleeps out in the hallway. That messes up the plan number two, all right. So he, he, he continues to devise in his deception. This is, this is how bad it gets. <clears throat> you deceive yourself. That, okay, that's cool. That's, but what happens? You keep deceiving yourself and you start deceiving other people. And that deception just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's, it's like you, you know, as a Christian, you said, you know, there's some things that I, I, I'm not going back to. I'm, I'm not going to do that again. But what happens? The more deception in your heart, the more you find yourself going back to those old things. Oh, you can still justify. Well, I'm not as bad as those other people are. You know, That's just more deception when you start justifying yourself. If you find yourself in a place where you're trying to hold yourself up and measure yourself by others' misdeeds and others' sins, you're in a bad place already. I mean, Jesus made it clear. He says, when you measure yourself with other men, you become fools. Uh-oh. That kind of marks that down real quick. So I need to quit comparing myself to people that are worse than me. Because, by the way, as long as I think I'm so hot and so good, I'm never, there's always plenty of people worse than me. No matter how bad I get in my mind. But that's deception. So Uriah gets sent to the front lines to be killed in battle. And now another sin's been added to the list. That's homicide. But he keeps it on the process. He, he, deceives, he deceives the people. He stands before them, does his spiritual things, his kingly things. But he's just pretending. He's just going through the process. Whenever you find yourself in this place in your spiritual walk in life where you're just pretending to be something you're not, you're in a bad place already. That just shows how much deception that you're walking in your life. And then he tries, ultimately, he's just trying to deceive God. He, at least he tries to. You can't deceive God. You think how foolish it is for us 
when we, we try to pretend to be something we're not, or we put on the show for, for somebody, you know, like we're really spiritual. That's just living a lie. You know, the Bible says we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But what happens if we don't? He said, but if, 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 if we don't acknowledge that we're sinners, he said, we lie and we do not do the truth. Now, what does that mean? It means not only are we living a lie, we're speaking a lie. We can't, you can't pull anything over on God. He's omniscient. That just kind of rules everything out right away, amen? He's omnipresent. He's a witness. He's an eyewitness. So honesty is certainly a better application to make here. And when you make this application, this blessing of just getting honest about our sin, is it, it, it deals a death blow to this self-deception. We're no longer being crippled by that. And what I mean by being crippled is it doesn't get any better. You just keep adding more to the misery and adding more to the pain and adding more to the sorrow as you increase with your, with, with your, with your lying attitude. It just makes it matters even more spiritually worse. Honesty brings about the blessing of decreased deceit, but also honesty brings about the blessing of removed conviction. When you look at verses 3 and 5 where he's talking about how the, the Lord deals with him and how his, his hand, you know, his, he said, I was just in pain. My body waxes old. I'm groaning all day long. I was wasting away like the, the heat of summer. I think somehow we think it's a bad thing when the Lord begins to convict us about our sin. People are abandoning strong, spiritually founded theological churches for this very reason. They're living in deception and they don't want to be, have it be brought out. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that, yeah, you're wrong. You'll continue to live wrong. You're going to pay the price when you're wrong. We don't want to hear that. So as the scripture said, it would be in the last days that people would heap to themselves teachers with what? Itching ears. In other words, they'll, they'll tell you what you want to hear. They'll say to you the things that you want to hear. They won't necessarily and most obviously tell you what you do need to hear. And what you need is truth. You know, what we need is re reality. We don't need to be uh, coddled along to live in some kind of pipe dream that we've built around our own little uh, self-made Christianity. We need to be honest with God. We need to be honest with Him and about our soul and about the Word of God, our walk with God, our relationship with each other. And the greatest thing that God has done for you as a child of God, that when you got saved, when you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came into your very being. The Bible said we let Jesus in our heart. Well, Jesus doesn't bodily come into our heart. The Holy Spirit comes into our life, and we're born of the Spirit, it says. Now, the Spirit has a work that he does in you. He has a work that he does in me. And the work that he does, well, it's, it's really faceted, many-sided. But one of the main things that he does, he convinces us or convicts us, all right? He convicts me. He lets me know, arms, that was stupid. All right, arms, that was sin. Arms, that was wrong. Arms, you know, uh, uh, that's just the way I hear it, all right? I'm sorry if it's, maybe it's a little too impersonal for you. I don't know. But, but the Lord has a way of just, check that off, buddy. That's not right. That's sin. The Bible says one of the ways that we can know we're children of God in First John is that hereby we know we're the children of God because now we know the whole world lies in wickedness. But what that also gives you an understanding of, your eyes are open to what sin is now. Once you give your life to Christ, the eyes come open, the mind's now awake, and you, you understand what's right and what's wrong. You know, I, I was amazed. There's, there's always people uh, have been in series and, and, and conferences and seminars about what's wrong with this or what's wrong with that, and what's, wrong, what's wrong with homosexuality, what's wrong with uh, adultery, what's wrong with porn. Hey, listen, I didn't have to have a conference. The day I gave my life to Jesus, I knew what was wrong with those things. Might not have understood it all, but I knew it was wrong because the Holy Spirit just bore witness with my spirit what the truth was. All right, it's just that it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And so what happens when I come to Christ now, that beautiful work of the Spirit is con to convict me, uh, uh, to live simply just to woo me. You know, he, he doesn't demand. The Holy Spirit woos. The devil, he's the demander, right? The demander in chief. You do this, you do this, you're so sorry, you're that. The Holy Spirit just convinces you. He convicts you to come this way. It starts always with conviction for the child of God. Now, if I don't repent, and David's talking about chastening that starts here, right? He said, I began, I, God began to deal with me. And so let me put it this way. If you can get away with sin, it doesn't bother you. You keep living in sin the way you're living in sin. It does, you, you've justified everything. It's all rational in your mind. Hey, you're not, there's something desperately wrong. The Bible says if you're without chastening, you're not a child of God. All right? If you can just go along to get along, pretend to be something else that you're really not, you know in your heart you're not, and, and 
then and you can just live without anybody. God doesn't bother you about that at all, and something's desperately wrong. Because when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we give our life to Jesus Christ. It's his, 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 his task, his ministry, is to make me more like Jesus and to empower me to be more like Jesus. And so when I'm wrong, he, he, he lets me know I'm wrong. That's, that's the beauty of my salvation. And the worst thing I can do is to push that away. The worst thing I can do when the Holy Spirit convicts me, oh, man, arms, that's, you know, that's, not, that's not right. That's the, w- the way you said that, the way you did that, what, what you actually, that's, that's not right. The worst thing I can do is push that away. Because when I push it away, you, you know what happens? One is, if we did it, we're guilty. You know, and I know psychologists will tell you today, well, that's a bad word. But God, God gave you that capacity to feel guilt, all right? And it's there for a good reason. It's to show you that you're wrong. It's kind of like pain. You get a pain in your body, lets you know that something's out of whack, all right? It's a signal. It's a sign. So here's the Holy Spirit, and conviction comes, and David said, here's what happened in my life. And he, he kind of breaks it down in this passage. It doesn't kind of, it's just reality. But he, breaks. he said, I just began to physically deteriorate. He said, my body's wasted. My vitality was drained like the fever heat of summer. I, I, just began, I began to pay physically the price for my sin. Now, I'm not saying that when we have an illness or a suffering or sickness, that all that, you know, that's all sin because, you know, sin is in the world. It's, it's in the world around us. And the Bible says we're in this world, but we're not of it. But, hey, still, hey, if there's a pandemic going around, I might get sick. doesn't mean I'm in sin. But I do know that if I am sick and it is due to sin, that my God, my Father, he loves me so much, he'll point out that's why you're suffering this, Arms. Joe, you need to straighten that out. That's the result of the, and, and that's what Paul told the Corinthians. He said, you guys are coming to the Lord's table. You're not even right with each other. He said, and you come and you take the Lord's Supper, which represents the grace and forgiveness of God, and you're just abusing it. He said, this reason some of you are sick. Some of you even died. Because when we don't respond to the chastening of the Spirit, then comes the condemnation of the flesh. Uh, John talks about in 1 John, there's a sin unto death for believers. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's any particular sin that God keeps over and over and over doing that you keep rejecting his word. So first of all, it's this physical deterioration. He said, I just suffered. So if I'm sick, which I am, I've got all this respiratory stuff going on like some of you do, and, you know, I'm, I'm wired out on antihistamines, but <laughs> I hope some of this is making sense to you today. I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit's going to translate it into English. All right? But I know that, you know, that, just because I'm sick doesn't mean there's sin. My, my heart's confessed up, so I'll deal with it and go on, amen? But the first thing, when I do have a fit, illness or an infirmity, I'm going to ask the Lord. If there's something I missed the mark on. And truth of the matter is, I usually don't even have to ask the Lord. He's already told me. And will I be honest with the Lord is the issue. After physical deterioration comes what? Emotional deterioration. David said, I was groaning all day long. My heart was burned. But I had no joy. If we don't deal with guilt, the effect of it is, is, is far-reaching. Number one, it does affect us physically, but also extremely affects us emotionally. If there's guilt in my life and I'm not getting with God, you just watch it begin to manifest all kinds of fruit because I'm guilty, but especially when I'm around people that are right with God. You know, people come in, hey, praise the Lord. I, I don't know, you, praise the Lord. You, you, you praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know if I want to praise the Lord. But if there's guilt in my spirit, man, it gets, it's, it's deep-reaching, it's far-reaching. You can, you can experience depression, you get this de- despair. There's anger. Certainly a spirit of sarcasm and negativity. Overly or extreme sensitivity. You just kind of fly off the handle at the least little thing. What you, what you just might call undue strong reactions. They just come as a result of the panic attacks. Well, the list really goes on and on and on. But all those are things that if we don't learn how to deal with guilt, and you don't, you don't deal with guilt... It, it, this is what society, they say, well, if you're facing guilt, you need to get rid of it, and it's, you need to blame somebody. So what we have is we have this heavy weight of guilt, so the psychologist and the humanist and the psychiatrist say, well, you, you, you should find somebody to blame for that. It's not really your fault. So I want to take all this blame that I'm having, you know. If my parents hadn't been so strictly religious, I wouldn't be having all these guilt. You know? So it's your parents' fault or whoever's fault. Ultimately, it boils down to God's fault. You start blaming God for everything, you're in deep water then. All right? But when we start, we displace the guilt, put it into blame. Now what happens? Well, it doesn't pro- solve the problem. Now it just becomes bitter because it's their fault. 
and it just increases the problem. He said, listen, I, when I finally got it right, I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say, when I got it right with God, man, it's like I could breathe, or like a heavy stone was rolled away, or the guilt was gone, I could breathe. Almost all, all of us have probably had that experience in one way or another, when you finally just dealt with something, <sighs> thank God that's a done with, and it, it feels like a huge weight rolled off your back. Along with that, is, it just con- it escalates from physical to emotional to ultimately to a spiritual deterioration. And by that means, like David said, day and night, your hand, he's talking about in a spiritual sense, your hand was heavy upon me. He's talking about the pressure that the Holy Spirit just bears down on us with. Speaking of Spurgeon, he made this statement. He said, God's hand, Spurgeon said, is very helpful when it uplifts, but it is awful when it presses down. He said, better a world on your shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on your heart like David. He said, it's a heavy thing. Maybe you're feeling that physical or that emotional and mental or spiritual pressure. It's only through this honesty we're talking about, genuine honesty, this transparency with the Lord. So if the Lord knows it all, he's waiting for you to own it. He's waiting for you to become responsible. He's waiting for you to take a righteous stand so that he can deal with it. He's not going to, he's not going to ride past your pride. In fact, the Bible says, we talked about last week in humility, God resists the proud. The fourth thing about honesty, it brings the blessing, we'll call it intimate counsel. I think of anything in my own spiritual walk in life, you say, if I, I fear the most in my walk with the Lord, is not hearing God speak to my heart, my spirit, about decisions and choices that need to be made at not having wisdom. I'm fearful of making decisions not only for my life and for my family, for my church, but just based on logic and reason because that's not the way the spiritual life works. It's not logical and rational to live this Christian life to start with. It's not logical and rational to bless those who persecute you, to love those who hate you, you know? That's not logical and rational. Now, I, I would fear the fact that I'm not hearing from God anymore. That's, that's, that'd be a terrible one. David's talking about this. He said, now that I've gotten right with God, you know, now that I've gotten, gotten right with the Lord, I, I can hear God speak. Look at verse 32, uh, uh, chapter 32, verse 8. He says this. He says, we didn't read this. this after this. He said, I will instruct you and teach you now. Because he's gotten honest and he's repented. I, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way which you should go. And I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And God says, you know, you're not going to be afraid of God watching. You're inviting God watching. When we're not right with God, we don't want God watching. We want to somehow excuse and justify, come up with excuses and rationalizations for why we're doing what we're doing. But now there's this welcoming. You that are parents of children, remember when you fuss at kids, especially when they're real little? The last thing they want to do is what? Look you in the eye. And you're, you're grabbing that little face and now you look at me. <laughs> Cup those little cheeks, you look at me. <laughs> we don't want to look at our parents when we're wrong. You see a teacher in the classroom, they don't want to look at the coach. They don't want to look at the teacher when they're wrong. But when our hearts are transparent, now our eyes become open now, and we want God looking on. We want his face upon us. We want his grace upon us. That's just the heart that's hungry for God. It's like the song we just sang that, you know, let your glory shine in his place, move in his place, empower us, Lord God, with that glory. This is, this is the beauty of, of just coming back to a spirit of reviving your life, this, this promise of, of what he'll do for the person who's just going to be real, you know? In the, in the 60s and 70s, we had the term about being plastic, man. Don't be plastic, man. <laughs> Some of you are old enough, you know what? Plastic, man, right? Being counterfeit. Don't be a cheap imitation of the real thing. Be real. And this is what God's designed. The verse, next verse in 32, verse 9, puts it this way. Don't be as a horse or as a mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include a, a bit and a bridle to hold them in check. The only way you're going to deal with this horse is put a bit and a bridle. You can turn him, you can move him, you can move forward, you can have him to stop because of the bit and the bridle and the whip. And without that, they're not going to obey. He said, don't be like that. You know? Don't, don't be that, that person who just always fighting God and always resisting God because you think you've got a better way. Look where you're at. It's not a better way. I finally had to wake up one day in my own life and just take a a close look, 
Not that imagined, tr fake look of what I, I thought my life was like, but be honest and where I was really at. And that's when I began to get my heart right with God. That's when I began to turn my face toward God and ask his face to shine upon me. I believe with all my heart God longs to do more in our life than we want him to do. Does that make sense to you? I believe God wants to do more in your life and in my life than we want him to do. I believe he wants to show more of that intimate beauty of his holiness, more of that intimate counsel, more of that supernatural direction so that we don't miss God in our life. I believe if we could somehow open our eyes, we'd see the Spirit of God just brooding over this place today, working and saying, I want to do something deep and real and lasting in your life, in your heart, in your home, in your family. This is the desire of God. How do you get there? You get there by being honest with God. That's where it starts. That's how you get to the place. And it, 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 honesty, simply put, that kind of honesty is developed by a full acknowledgement and a full confession according to verse 5 of my sin. I acknowledge my sin and I confess my sin, he says. I acknowledge my sin and I confess my sin. If, if you look in verse 5 of that chapter, there's like eight times he uses a personal pronoun in this one verse. Listen to this. For I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now there's ownership there. There's no, well, Lord, you know, Bathsheba shouldn't have been out there. You know? Or I probably shouldn't, I should have gone. If they put more pressure on me to go off to the battle with the other king, the other leaders, I'd have been out in battle. And, you know, it had to, it's, it's all those guys that were around me. I had bad counsel. They didn't tell me what I needed to do. No. There's no searching for excuses. There's no justifications. There's no reasons. It's just that I was wrong. I did wrong. I didn't do what God told me to do. I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I didn't act the way I was supposed to act. That's the only remedy to dishonesty is full acknowledgement, full honesty before God. David said, I will con confess my transgressions to the Lord, and the Lord did forgive me of the guilt of my sin. There it is. I confess, God forgives. I confess, God forgives. I don't confess, I don't experience forgiveness. Even though Jesus Christ has paid the price. That's why 1 John says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, you can just trans tr tr flip that. If I do not confess my sins, my God who's faithful and just will not forgive my sins, <laughs> nor will he forgive me of all these iniquities, nor will he cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want the blessing that he's talking about in these two words, the power of that word, we don't have time to get into today about blessed, blessed. If I really want to experience the blessed life that God's given me, which obviously means forgiveness, which means no more deceit in my life, which means I'm not under the heaviness of conviction, which means I'm no longer uh, facing the, the difficulties of my rebellion. I'm now in the intimate counsel of my heavenly father. And it's going to have to start with this a transparent honesty before the Lord. Can't do that? I'm just going through the motions. Just going through the motions. Arthur Pink expressed this passion for honesty, and he was a saint who wrote many books and commentaries and 100 plus years ago. But he expressed this honesty and holiness in a, in a prayer that would be appropriate for our lives. And let me just read this as he prayed. Search me, O God. Reveal me to myself. If I am deceived, <laughs> deceive me there, it'd be eternally too late. And enable me to measure myself faithfully by thy word, so that I may discover whether or not my heart's been renewed, and whether I've abandoned every course of self-will and truly surrendered to thee. Whether I have so repented that I hate all sin and fervently long to be free from its power, and I loathe myself and seek diligently to deny myself. Whether my faith is that which overcomes the world, or whether it be only a mere notional thing which produces no godly living, whether I'm a fruitful branch of the vine or just a, only a cucumber on the ground. In short, whether I be a new creature in Christ or only a painted hypocrite, if I have an honest heart, 
then I am willing, yea, anxious to face and to know the real truth about myself. That's pretty powerful. That's simply the same thing that David was praying. He said, Lord, search me. Know me. See if there be any wicked, deceitful, harmful way in me. How many of us are willing to linger in prayer before the Lord like that? How many of us are willing just to come to start with and say, Lord, these things are in my life right now. Lord, the things you've spoken to me about today, I give those to you. So, Lord, not only do I give that to you, I'm giving everything. I'm giving my life completely over. So whatever else is there, may I see it. May I, may, may, I, may I view it so that I can acknowledge it, so we can start working on this. We can start dealing with this, and we can start moving and growing in grace and living in that fellowship. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it all. John said, this is the message in First John that we have heard from God. You know, and it's a message of fellowship that we may walk in the light and have fellowship with each other and with him. The beauty of that intimate walk with God is stolen from so many Christians. Now, I just believe even if you go to a church that doesn't even preach this kind of stuff, if you're a Christian, I believe God's still going to get a hold of you. You may try to avoid it. You're going to have somebody out in, in your old church who's going to come bug you. <laughs> You're going to see a billboard, a sign, a verse. Somebody's going to say something that bugs you. God, God loves you enough to stay after you. Because he said, surely in the flood of great waters, there's no one to rescue. You don't wait for the floods to come. Get your heart right. Seek the Lord while he may be found, the Bible says. Seek the Lord while he's calling you. See, I just don't know if I have what it takes to get right. If God was not calling you, you would not have it. But God is calling. Wherever God speaks, he empowers. Wherever God speaks. But you have to have a heart that's right. Let me flip back to Isaiah 6 in closing. Isaiah said, the year the Uzziah the king died. And I talked about that in our e-blast this week. I don't know what your Uzziah might be, whatever's in the way. God has a way of dealing with stuff that gets in our way. The year the king Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. Train filled the temple, and there were six winged creatures flying about the throne of God, saying, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. And he said, Then I confessed my sin. I said, Lord, I am, a, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He said, Then the angel of the Lord took the tongs from off the altar and put the coals in my lips. Notice it's a sign of God's purifying, cleansing power on his heart and life. He said, Then because after you get right with God, there's going to be a then. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will go for me? Now, this is a man of God. He's speaking, all right? And now this man of God's getting right with God. And he's hearing the message that God's been trying to tell him all along. God said, I'm going to send somebody. And now he says, I can hear the Lord. Do you want to know what's next in your life? It's bigger and better than what you can possibly think. But you're not going to know the next if you get honest about what God's dealing with you right now. The then moment won't happen until we confess our sin. So then I heard the voice of the Lord, and the Lord was saying, who will go? Now the devil's whispering, I'm sure, and Isaiah's there, well, it's not you, buddy. <laughs> you're a mess. Isaiah raised in, here am I, Lord. <laughs> Send me. All the things we think would disqualify us, God said, I'll take care of those things. I'm the qualifier. Just get your hand up. <laughs> Just get your heart open, your ears open, your eyes open, and see what God will do. Amen? I believe that the Lord is stirring in our midst. I think we've seen some unique movements of the Spirit of God in our church. I pray that you're, you have eyes to see what the Lord is up to. I pray that God's working in your heart. I'm praying that you move to a place to really be excited about the activity of the Holy Spirit in your heart, your life, and in your church. And that you'd be like, like Isaiah, get it, get it right before the Lord. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, I, I need to get right with you and allow the Lord to touch you and to cleanse you and wash you. 
and then say, Lord, what, what's next? What do you have for me? I want to be a part of what you're up to. I started the service by saying, I don't know if maybe some of you might have never been in those kind of moves. I think most of you have been around here for a while. I've seen God, we've seen God move some unique times in some very unique ways over the years. Sometimes in a conference, sometimes in a ladies' retreat, sometimes in a men's retreat, sometimes in a revival service that we've had. And I think that hopefully all of us have seen revival in our own spiritual lives at different times. But that real corporate move of God, that real corporate move of God, I believe God is longing to do that in our midst. And I think if we'll just get our hearts in a place, we'll just collectively begin to pray for that together, that God will do that. But we have to be humble and we have to be honest. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me with your heart and your head bowed before the Lord. Maybe you want to come to this altar this morning and just take some time in the prayer. The band's going to come. We're going to begin to worship the Lord. I'll be here. If you want to pray, Gary will be here. Anybody else wants to come or pray with others or if someone's at the altar and you want to pray with them or just want to come to the altar and pray, let's just take some time to ask the Lord, number one, about ourselves, and then ask the Lord to let us be involved in a, in a, a broader outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, folks, when I say the altar's open, that means that requires humility and honesty. So today, if you're going to be humble and honest before the Lord, just come between you and your heavenly Father, between you and your high priest, the Lord Jesus. Find a place to pray and pour your heart out to God this morning. If you don't know Jesus, Pastor Gary's here, I'm here. It's a choice that only you can make today. There's not a specific magic prayer, all right? It's a matter of your heart, for the heart of man believes unto righteousness. It's a commitment of the heart. It's also a confession. We thank the Lord for what he's done. We welcome him into our lives. We confess now that he's our Lord and Savior. So today, if you're ready to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why don't you come to Gary or I, and we'll let us pray over you and rejoice with you in your decision and thank God for what he's doing in your life. Give you some information that will help you in your walk. But if there's something else you want to pray about or pray with somebody about, feel free. But more than anything else, folks, let's, this morning I've just asked God that people just drop the pretense about everybody thinks I'm wonderful and right with God. What would they think? They're not thinking about you. They're, you're thinking about you. They're thinking about them. All right? Let's think about God. Let's let God just work in our hearts and spirits and do that which only he can do. I believe God's up to some marvelous things. Let's allow him to work in us. You come. We worship the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed
Thank you for your amazing grace. God, I pray, Lord, I know when these, these types of messages are preached, it's often our first reaction is to put up a quick wall. But Lord, I pray you tear the walls down. Lord, I pray these words that you've planted in our hearts would not be stolen. We know the adversary comes to steal the seed of the word of God when it's been sown. God, help us to have the hearts that are cultivated and broken up and ready to receive the seed. Lord, do that which only you can do in us. Forgive us of our pretending, our cover-ups, our makeovers. Instead of just showing you who we really are and being honest with you, that you already know these things. God, I pray that these words will take deep root within our souls and our spirit and bring forth the fruit of revival. Don't let us just cast these things away. Draw us to yourself, to your heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I may say amen. amen. Continue to pray for Miss Kathy and Camille both, and our house got visited by this uh, upper respiratory thing over the last couple of weeks and kind of tried to settle in on me the last few days. Uh, I'm not contagious. I don't have a fever. I just got all this crud. All right. So uh, God's been, God is gracious and God is faithful. We'll get through it. But I do appreciate your prayers. Amen. Lift us up to the Lord, uh, especially Miss Kathy and Camille. They got the really the worst brunt of it. Amen. So lift them up as well. Brother Gary, come share some good stuff with us. Actually, going to let Pastor Matt lead us off first. Here, he's got an announcement that he wanted to to give to the church. Yeah. So um, next week we will be having a meeting for those who are interested in serving in VBS next Sunday, the twenty sixth. Now this year, guys, we are we are trusting the Lord for twice as many kids as we had last year, which means we need a lot more help from our adults, from our youth. So if you're interested in, in finding out more about serving in our VBS, I'm going to be back here by our student fundraiser board. If you can see me after service, me or Miss Karen, we're going to be back there. And in fact, if, if you're interested in serving in any areas of our student ministry, that's children's ministry, youth ministry, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, come see me. You know, it's not all about teaching lessons. Maybe that's where God has led you, and, and praise God for that. But maybe, praise God, that you, you are led to just listen to the children listen to scripture or just be in the room and, and watch them. So if you're interested in helping with VBS this year, which is June 19th through the 22nd, or any area of our children's ministry, come see me or Miss Karen right after service. So, Pastor Matt, let me ask you a question. Let's say I'm interested in, in serving Wednesday nights or Sunday nights, Sunday mornings. Does that mean I got to be upstairs every Sunday or got to be with the kids every Wednesday? That's a great question. No, we, we do a rotation because we want our leaders to be fed in service. And so our leaders are on rotation. So they're upstairs some Sundays, they're downstairs some Sundays. Uh, they're downstairs more um, than they are upstairs or it's, it's pretty equal. So it's not every single Sunday. So if that's where you feel led or even if you're watching online, you weren't able to make it today, give us a call. Uh, we're in the office Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5. So give us a call now. I'll give you all the details of our meeting that's coming up on the 26th. And so just to reiterate, I mean, just because you serve, in, and we have some people, Sarah, you serve upstairs. It's not every month you're up there. And so there's an opportunity for you to continue to come down into the main service. So you're not gone and forgotten, right? Because sometimes that happens. We think we need to say, oh, I'm going to serve upstairs in the children's. I want to serve upstairs in the children's, but I also want to be down here for worship and ministry and here and continue to be fed. And so Pastor Matt and his team do a great job of alternating months. Or, and and, and it, it could be week to week. 
And so don't let that commit you not to serve and, and not to follow what God has called you to do. The other uh, other announcement we have, of course, is our men's conference this Friday night. Uh, it starts at 530. The cost is $10. $10. The meal starts at 530. And then we'll have, we have two great speakers, a great worship leader. So you do want to miss it. Guys, please sign up and be accounted for to attend that conference. For um, and Don't forget your tithes and offering. We don't pass a plate. There's an offer receptacle in the back. You can drop a check off in the tithe, the tithe box or at our church Monday through Thursday. With that being said, you are dismissed. <laughs>